Thank you for joining me, and welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So over my past couple of podcasts, intertwined with some TV and movie podcasts, I had done Cognitive Dissonance and Cognitive Distortions. Today I'll be talking about cognitive behavior therapy. I will read two articles or somewhat. I'll put the links in the description. Usually I read the, the article and interject a little bit here and there, but mostly it's straight from the articles. Now the first one is basically a description. It's from the APA, the American Psychological Association. What is cognitive behavioral therapy? CBT is a form of psychological treatment that has been demonstrated to be effective for a range of problems, including depression, anxiety disorders, alcohol and drug use problems, marital problems, eating disorders, and severe mental illness. Numerous research suggests that CBT leads to significant improvements in functioning and quality of life. In many studies, CBT has been demonstrated to be as effective as, or more effective than, other forms of psychological therapy or psychiatric medications. Now that's interesting. There's another article I'll read, and in the descriptions it'll give some links to some things. This is just talking about it in general, but there are numerous studies, you can look at it. I'll continue. It is important to emphasize that advances in CBT have been made on the basis of both research and clinical practice. Indeed, CBT is an approach for which there is ample scientific evidence that the methods that have been developed actually produce change. In this manner, CBT differs from many other forms of psychological treatment. CBT is based on several core principles, including 1. Psychological problems are based in part on faulty or unhelpful ways of thinking. 2. Psychological problems are based in part on learned patterns of unhelpful behavior. 3. People suffering from psychological problems can learn better ways of coping with them, thereby relieving their symptoms and becoming more effective in their lives. Now, I'm going to interject a little bit again. This is why I stress so heavily on my foundations of wellness, that I believe that if we had a breathing and meditation curriculum for young kids, and people know, psychologists, doctors, they understand the developmental uh, progress of the brain from early childhood to adult, fashion these breathing and meditation techniques, the whole world would improve. But, I'll continue. CBT treatment usually involves efforts to change thinking patterns. These strategies might include learning to recognize one's distortions in thinking that are creating problems, and then reevaluate them in light of reality. Gaining a better understanding of the behavior and motivation of others. Using problem-solving skills to cope with difficult situations. Learning to develop a greater sense of confidence in one's own abilities. CBT treatment also usually involves efforts to change behavioral patterns. These strategies might include facing one's fears instead of avoiding them, use role-playing to prepare for potentially problematic interaction with others, learning to calm one's mind and relax one's body. Now, again, this is one of my favorite subjects, obviously. This is super important. Learning to calm one's mind and relax one's body. Now, we're all different. There are many situations where there are genetic problems and issues with chemicals and the way the brain works. Certain things, this is not an a end or be all cure. However, for the more daily life stresses this is a breakthrough in my opinion i think it was the 60s 
when it first started becoming, um, I'll get to that article, I think. Anyway, really important. I'll continue. Not all CBT will use all of these strategies. Rather, the psychologist and patient client work together in a collaborative fashion to develop an understanding of the problem and to develop a treatment strategy. CBT places an emphasis on helping individuals learn to be their own therapist through exercises in the session as well as homework exercises outside of sessions. Patients' clients are helped to develop coping skills, whereby they can learn to change their own thinking, problematic emotions, and behavior. CBT therapists emphasize what is going on in the person's current life, rather than what has led up to their difficulties. A certain amount of information about one's history is needed, but the focus is primarily on moving forward in time to develop more effective ways of coping with life. There you go, the APA's description of cognitive behavior therapy. It's important, and again, I stress this a lot. Let's get rid of the stigma with mental health. Let's treat it like going to the gym when you go to pump weights. All these exercises, I mean, you want to consider critical thinking and just our reps at the gym. All right, that link will be in the description. It's from the American Psychological Association. Then I'm going to move on to an article which gives a little more uh, around the edges of this uh, nuances. It's from Very Well Mind website by Kendra Sherry. And again, it's what is cognitive behavioral therapy? Um, does anything else I have to give credit for here? I believe that's it. Okay, so I'll put this link also in the description. And this will be a little bit repetitive, but when it flows through the rest of the article, it gives you a little more nuance to it, I think. CBT is a type of psychological treatment that helps people learn how to identify and change destructive or disturbing thought patterns that have a negative influence on behavior and emotions. Cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on changing the automatic negative thoughts that can contribute to and worsen emotional difficulties depression, and anxiety. These spontaneous negative thoughts have a detrimental influence on mood. Through CBT, these thoughts are identified, challenged, and replaced with more objective, realistic thoughts. Super important. I'm giving you a little more of the nuance on what CBT is. And if you can help people, and like I said, there are outliers to everything, Some people have a lot of different disorders. There's a little bit of a misfiring and stuff, and that's all neuroscience and, I guess, evolutionary biology. I'll continue. Types of cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT encompasses a range of techniques and approaches that address thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. These can range from structured psychotherapies to self-help materials. There are a number of specific types of therapeutic approaches that involve CBT. And I'll go through a couple of some of them now. Cognitive therapy centers on identifying and changing inaccurate or distorted thinking patterns, emotional responses, and behaviors. Now, there's a link here. It's highlighted in blue, distorted thinking patterns, which is great because you can then go look and go check. Dialectal dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, addresses thoughts and behaviors while incorporating strategies such as emotional regulation and mindfulness. Again, meditation, a little bit of focus on thoughts, and I go into that on my other podcast if you want to check those out. Multimodal therapy suggests that psychological issues must be treated by addressing seven different interconnected modalities, which are behavior, affect, sensation, imagery, cognition, interpersonal factors, and drug biological considerations. Rational Emotional Behavior Therapy, REBT, involves identifying irrational beliefs actively challenging these beliefs, and finally, learning to recognize and change these thought patterns. 
While each type of cognitive behavioral therapy takes a different approach, all work to address the underlying thought patterns that contribute to psychological distress. And that's another thing not really talked about a lot is the turning point and the cascade of distress and despair and how they spiral and what the human body does about it. And it's a sad state when you look at police officers in the military with suicide rates. And this is why people who talk on hotlines are trained to watch and listen to words and how people are using things. You could see the thought patterns and the distortions in their writing, in the way they talk or type. Identifying negative thoughts. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I missed one. Techniques. CBT is about more than identifying thought patterns. It is focused on using a wide range of strategies to help people overcome these thoughts. Such techniques may include journaling, role-playing, relaxation techniques, and mental distractions. Identifying negative thoughts. It is important to learn how thoughts, feelings, and situations can contribute to maladaptive behaviors. This process can be difficult, especially for people who struggle with introspection, but it can ultimately lead to self-discovery and insights that are essential part of the treatment process. Hello, world. This is so much of, we are so, it's just a weird thing to say, we are so human. This is who we are. You got to learn these things. I think it's very important. Practicing new skills. It is important to start practicing new skills that can then be put to use in the real world situation. For example, a person with a substance abuse disorder might start practicing new coping skills and rehearsing ways to avoid or deal with social situations that could potentially trigger a relapse. Goal setting. Goal setting can what goal setting can an important step in recovery from mental can be i guess an important step in recovery from mental illness and helping you make changes to improve your health and life during cbt a therapist can help with goal setting skills by teaching you how to identify your goal distinguish between short and long-term goals set smart uh this smart is actually an acronym i think it's specific measurable attainable relevant time-based goals <laughs> And focus on the process as much as the end outcome. Problem solving. Learning problem solving skills can help you identify and solve problems that arise from life stresses, both big and small, and reduce the negative impact of psychological and physical illness. Problem solving in CBT often involves five steps. In identifying a problem, two, Generating a list of possible solutions. Three, evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of each possible solution. Four, choosing a solution to implement. Five, implementing the solution. Again, I'm going to interject here. This is what I really appreciate about certain methods of therapy. It's helping somebody but giving them the tools to help them in the future to help their friends to help their families not everybody's going to be a psychologist or a therapist or a counselor even however we know that just having a friend to talk to helps and if you know a little bit about these things you can help others and yourself but the problem i see a lot out there is no one can see their own problems. This is why sometimes you need a little bit of help. It is, we've, we self-deceive so well. I think these things are important. We got to get a handle on our thoughts, our breathing, control our mind and body. Anyway, I will continue. Self-monitoring. Also known as diary work. Self-monitoring is an important part of CBT that involves tracking behaviors, symptoms, or experiences over time 
and sharing them with your therapist. Self-monitoring can help provide your therapist with the information needed to provide the best treatment. For example, for eating disorders, self-monitoring may involve keeping track of eating habits, as well as any thoughts or feelings that went along with consuming that meal or snack. Now, again, this is, you know, something that we should all understand. You write down what your, pro, you know, the, the things that lead up to these problems, and you can figure it out yourself. You can use the knowledge and the wisdom. You don't have to have a degree. Obviously, I do recommend always going to a professional. And there's also plenty of links here, highlighted words that lead to other articles, so you can see what self-monitoring actually means. There's a related article link, how behavioral therapy works. I'll continue. What CBT can help with. Cognitive behavior therapy can be used as a short-term treatment to help individuals learn to focus on present thoughts and beliefs. CBT is used to treat a wide range of conditions including addiction, anger issues, anxiety, bipolar disorder, depression, eating disorders, panic attacks, personality disorders, phobias. In addition to mental health conditions, CBT has been found to help people cope with the following. Chronic pain or serious illness, divorce or breakups, grief or loss, insomnia, low self-esteem, relationship problems, and stress management. Again, important. This is everybody's daily lives. These things mount up on us. Our brains work 24 hours a day. Look at some of these things it can help with. Just daily things that people go through that just make the little stresses in life start to add up. Divorce or breakups. I mean, grief or loss. That's just, you know. I'll continue. Benefits. The underlying concept behind CBT is that thoughts and feelings play a fundamental role in behavior. For example, a person who spends a lot of time thinking about plane crashes, runaway accidents, and other air disasters may avoid air travel as a result. The goal of cognitive behavior therapy is to teach people that while they cannot control every aspect of the world around them, they can take control of how they interpret and deal with things in their environment. CBT is also known for the following key benefits. It allows you to engage in healthier thinking patterns by becoming aware of the negative and often unrealistic thoughts that dampen your feelings and moods. It is an effective short-term treatment option. For example, improvements can be seen in 5 to 20 sessions. It has been found effective for a wide variety of maladaptive behaviors. It is often more affordable than some other types of therapy. It has been found to be effective online as well as face-to-face. -face. That, I think, is super important. It can be used for those who don't require psychotropic medication. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. People, some people need medication. It's just, you know, there's not so much talking and delving deep into these things that, that can't be solved. One of the greatest benefits of cognitive behavior therapy is that it helps clients develop coping skills that can be useful both now and in the future. And this is what I mean by tools. You know, you're giving people the tools to be more helpful in their own problems and happiness in life. Effectiveness. CBT emerged during the 1960s and originated in the work of psychiatrist Aaron Beck. Ah, that's what I was forgetting before. Aaron Beck's name is highlighted in blue. You can hit the link and go to him. Who noted that certain types of thinking contributed to emotional problems. Beck labeled these automatic negative thoughts and developed the process of cognitive therapy. Where earlier behavior types had focused on behavior therapies had focused almost exclusively on associations, reinforcements, and punishments to modify behavior, 
the cognitive approach addressed how thoughts and feelings affect behaviors. Today, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most well-studied forms of treatment and has been shown to be effective in the treatment of a range of mental conditions including anxiety, depression, eating disorders, insomnia, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, PTSD, and substance use disorder. That is super important. This is not just a couple of studies here and there. This is decades now of research and real good science. CBT is the leading evidence-based treatment for eating disorders. CBT has been proven helpful in those with insomnia as well as those who have a general medical condition that infers or interferes with sleep, including those affected with pain or mood disorders such as depression. Cognitive behavioral therapy has been scientifically proven to be effective in treating symptoms of depression and anxiety in children and adolescents. And by the way, the highlighted words, you can hit the links, it'll bring you to things, relevant things. A 2018 meta-analysis of 41 studies found that CBT helped to improve symptoms in people with anxiety and anxiety-related disorders, including obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. CBT has a high level of empirical support for treatment of substance use disorders, helping improve self-control, avoid triggers, and develop coping mechanisms for daily stressors. CBT is one of the most researched type of therapy in part because treatment is focused on highly specific goals and results can be measured relatively easy. Easily. Things to consider. There are several challenges that people may run into during the course of cognitive behavioral therapy. Change can be difficult. Initially, some patients suggest that while they recognize that certain thoughts are not rational or healthy, simply becoming aware of these thoughts does not make it easy to alter them. <clears throat> Check out my cognitive distortions podcast. <laughs> CBT is very structured. Cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't tend to focus on underlying unconscious resistance to change as much as other approaches such as psychoanalytic psychotherapy. It is often best suited for clients who are more comfortable with a structured and focused approach in which the therapist often takes an instrumental role. People must be willing to change. <laughs> for cognitive behavioral therapy to be effective, the individual must be ready and willing to spend time and effort analyzing their thoughts and feelings. Such self-analysis analysis and homework can be difficult, but it is a great way to learn more about how internal states impact outward behavior. Progress is often gradual. In most cases, CBT is a gradual process that helps a person take incremental steps toward a behavior change. For example, someone with social anxiety might start simply by might start by simply imagining anxiety provoking situations. Next they might start practicing conversations with friends, family, and acquaintances. Heard the fucking call alarm thing? Anyway, I got distracted. <laughs> By progressively working toward a larger goal, the process seems less daunting and the goals easier to achieve. All right. I can go a little thing in there with personal things, uh, the people I've helped, friends and family, or friends of friends. All right, let's go. How to get started. Cognitive behavior therapy can be an effective treatment choice for a range of psychological issues. If you feel that you or someone you love might benefit from this form of therapy, cons yeah, everybody, consider the following steps. Consult with your physician and or check out the Directory of Certified Therapists offered by the National Association of Cognitive Behavioral Therapists to locate a licensed professional in your area. There's also a, a highlighted link. Consider your personal preferences, including whether it's a face-to-face or well, online therapy will work best for you. Contact your health insurance to see if they cover CBT, and if so, 
how many sessions they cover per year. Expect your initial experience to be similar to a doctor's appointment, including filling out paperwork such as HIPPA forms, insurance information, medical history, current medications, a questionnaire about your symptoms, and a therapist-patient service agreement. If you're participating in online therapy, you'll likely fill out these forms online. Be prepared to answer questions about what brought you to therapy, your symptoms, and your history, including your childhood, education, career, relationships, family, romantic, and friends, and current living situation. Then there's a related link, what to expect during your first therapy session. All right, so we're done. These are important aspects of life. This is sort of an agreement I made with um, uh, my fiance battled cancer for 13 out of the 17 years we were together and she passed away. But during that process, I had always been trying to help her. And I told her my life story. You can listen to my podcast, who is Joseph F. Olsis. And at a young age, I noticed something wrong with my mom. And by the time I was 16, I was diving deep into it to try to help her. And throughout my life, it's been an interest and almost obsession. Neuroscience, psychology, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, all these topics. I've even read books on how magic fools people, on mentalist. And in saying that, it starts to, you know, dawn on you how important it is to people. And this is, was so helpful to me that I try to use it in certain ways with all the people that I inter interact with in my life, whether they knew it or not. Looking back, I would hope that some people are at least have tools. And that was always my major thing, is give people tools to help themselves. And I think... Just by going through the process, looking into it can help. And it is very important when you put these all together. Cognitive distortions, cognitive dissonance. These are things we have to deal with and face. And it seems to me, because I was a child once growing up, it was a whirlwind of chaos growing up. I don't think... The methods we have work. And it was an interesting article. I might delve into that at one point in a series of podcasts about uh, we now have like a four decades of uh, studies on different teaching methods. And one of them has just skyrocketed and shown such potential. I might look into that and do a podcast. But what it does is I think it shows that at a young age and we can understand the cognitive developmental processes we know to a certain extent what is going on in a baby's brain and a three-year-old's and a seven-year-old's and we kind of have an understanding of you know now we're thinking it's later in life going more towards 28 29 that we fully become formed adults in the brains and learning these things at a young age can be super helpful and Part of the philosophies and um, teachings try to give you a good way to say it is like inoculation from stupidity. It sounds ridiculous, but all these things are beliefs. They are thought patterns. These are processes that if we can harness at a young age, we're not going to say everybody's going to be super perfect people. But going around coping, I think it is super important. And I think going and getting help is super important. And that's another exclamation point I want to put on this. Go get help. Talk to somebody. You want to contact me? Private message. I don't care. I'll give you my phone number. We'll talk. I do not have any degrees or any certifications. I just happen to be in this for a good 34 years now 
and like I said, it started from nine uh, between nine and thirteen, watching something going on with my mom and wondering about it to sixteen years old, sitting in the kitchen, my mom thin as a rail, wouldn't eat, calling the cops on us, trying to trying to get it help, and trying to figure out a way to get around what was going on in her brain. And it helped me drastically. And if you listen to my podcast, we all have moments in our life. And these moments will help. And especially recently when my fiance passed away. By this understanding. And this. These tools that I had learned and developed. And I wish everybody would think of it like going to the gym. Because I say this in some of my podcasts. Because a lot focus on this area. We get pumped up. Hey. I don't want to say names, but we don't go into the gym. Oh, shit, yeah, you're doing reps. Oh, and you go there and you cheer them on. You help them. You do the reps, you know. And it's like, oh, you know, my biceps. Look, I got a better looking body. I'm in shape. I'm healthier. Let's do that with psychology. Let's do that with therapy. Let's do that with mental health. I try in this breathing and mental exercise, meditation. Oh, I, I broke my concentration. Well, that's a rep. You do it again. And you do it again, and you develop these tools, and they are super helpful. And I'll say it real quick at the end. Breathe in through your nose slowly, three to five seconds. Let it out through your mouth, seven to eight seconds. And the theory here, the method is longer out through your mouth than in through the nose. And you can mess with this time depending on, you know, your breathing technique or your capacity. It's basically, I think, described as a power breath. On the out breath is your focus and your balance. For a split second, you'll recognize everything falling away. And this is the foundation I really believe should be implemented and taught. Once we learn the breathing, go look at the science. There's literally real science behind it. And not the wishy-washy bullshit that really ruins certain industries or uh, you know areas of science and research is when people take things like freud and whatever and then start a wave of uh, suedo nonsense bullshit and they take the little bits of truth and this and that no i, I just don't believe in that you're not going to be able to meditate and le- uh, meditate to levitate you cannot meditate to survive only on sunlight for six years. It just it just gets to be nonsense. So there's a little bit of truth here and there. And you got to learn. But maybe I'll do more podcasts on things like critical thinking. And skepticism or, or things like that. Anyway. This is what is cognitive behavioral therapy. I really hope people will treat this seriously. Mental health should be cheered and or uh, uh, mental health therapies and exercises should be cheered on just like going to the gym i say again if anybody has any issues want to talk to me about it reach out to me in some way i'll be happy to talk to you i wish everybody the best health physical and mental until next time take care